as we move into our second hour here, we're going to unpack the first of our four beacons, and that's connect the dots. So when we say connect the dots, we're talking a lot about data, connecting data. Um, so it, we're, we're going to dig into um, adapting to changes and data privacy and all that, you know, the rules that are changing from Apple to Google and, and laws and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the role of architecture in the nonprofit landscape. And, and we're also going to talk about how we can activate data for better fundraising and marketing. So, uh, Chirian, um, first, I, I want to dig into the new project you just had that you just came out with, with Rogare. Uh, and I think I'm saying that right, correct? Yeah. Rogare, the think tank. Um, it's pulling me back to my high school years of four years of Latin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so tell us, tell us about the project. What is, what is it about and, and what was your role in it? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thanks for having me on. I was listening to Julia and I'm like nodding along backstage and like, we should just replay Julia for the next video. <laughs> but, um, in, in, uh, so Regari is Latin for to ask, and it's the fundraising think tank. It's a, it's a global consortium of folks who care about fundraising and ethics uh, in particular, but really are at the nexus of, we're not academics and we're not um, solely just practitioners who are tactical. We're trying to bridge the gap between what is, um, what sort of right to do and how do we think about it at a higher level. So I got involved with Regari about seven years ago. I heard the director, Ian McQuellen, speak at AFP Icon, and he said a line that resonated with me. He said, there's no uh, existing normative theory of fundraising ethics. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's true. There isn't. Um, and so what uh, I, I got involved with a couple of different projects and papers, and the one that we just finished is on artificial intelligence and ethics, because folks in the network will surface up these ideas, things that they care about. We've got one on disintermediation of giving right now, one on the history of fundraising. Um, so all these different projects, and then they, we bring together a global consortium of folks and put together pieces around that really to forward the discussion. So I was lucky enough to be part of a, a large global um, kind of thought leadership discussion around artificial intelligence and where that's landing in different countries and in different aspects of nonprofits and fundraising around the world. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Chirian. I'm curious, why AI? Like, why did this project come about? Why that topic? Well, so part of it was me. Um, I spent the pandemic after watching all of Netflix and having too many open bottles of wine um, and, you know, chatting with Julia on Zoom. I was like, this is not a good use of my time. And I started building something in AI that I hoped would be somewhat helpful and then um, brought that product to market and then eventually um, sold it to iWave. It was acquired by iWave at the end of the year, uh, last year. And so in part of that, obviously AI is sort of everywhere now. And mm -hmm. it, as we talk about all these different use cases and products and technologies that are out there that are associated, we started, a bunch of us started talking about what are the ethics of not just generative AI and chat GPT, but at a higher level and larger level, who can who can we bring in to start thinking about these things and really providing um, some swim lanes around what what are the ethical ramifications rather than just how can this be used? That's fun to talk about, of course, right? Like it's super cool. I thought about doing a promo for this using AI generated video and, and whatnot and like in a time, uh, but it was too complicated, but you get the idea, right? Like there's fun things to talk about in AI, but we've got to, because of uh, what you all were sharing around the trust in the nonprofit sector, we've got to be very careful about how technology is used in particular AI. And that's the drumbeat for everybody on the project team. What were some of the conclusions that y'all have come to regarding ethics and AI? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I think the key for us at this point is that this is a research agenda, not necessarily a conclusion. So um, some of us very much love AI and want it to be used everywhere and anywhere. Some of us are much more skeptical. And uh, some people were just, I, I wouldn't say like Luddites, but some people were very much like, we shouldn't use this at all. And um, what's helpful about having that sort of global perspective with that ethical lens is then saying, what are the different concerns that are laying out across different 
use cases, different scenarios, and what should we be thinking about inside of our own shops, but also sector wide to move these discussions forward. So with regard to um, the, the sort of landscape, of course, you know, Ryan, we talked about things like data privacy um, and security. That's first and foremost, probably the, the big issue that governs a lot of these things, not just in terms of generative AI and uh, personal identifiable information, but more in terms of like machine learning and prospecting and uh, algorithms that might tell you who your next best donor is or what that next gift might look like. So making sure that all of those things are, are thought of. And then what are, so there are those first order effects, things like, um, like data privacy and security, but also things like staffing inside of our organizations who really want to be mindful of how AI could be interpreted or misinterpreted inside of organizations to advance the mission. And what does that look like? How are we, um, how are we thinking about that both, again, inside of our organizations, but sector-wide. The thing that we keep coming back to is that there's no view from nowhere. So you can't just sort of say like, this is a good use without realizing that there's an impact on how your donors, your volunteers, your other community stakeholders view your organization and also how your staff thinks about the security of their jobs and their roles and, and professional development um, and what that means. So lots of ramifications around that, but then also even like secondary effects like climate. Um, which is, you know, brought someone brought that up in our in our group conversations around, you know, data warehouses and how that's impacting um, our and you know our environment. So lots to unpack. Um, we'll share the link to the report here in the. I'll do this now. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in in reading more about it, it's a blessedly short piece, but we hope that it sparks additional conversation and people who, you know, add to the research agenda or dive deeper into that and start discussing uh, particular elements. I'm curious as someone who's obviously an advocate and, uh, you know, on the pro AI side, right? What, what concerns, you know, are most on your mind, you know, not the, not the ones who are like, no, no AI, never, never, but yeah. you know, what, what, what's keeping you up at night when it comes to AI? Uh, so I laugh because my friend Barbara O'Reilly and, and Sean um, from, from Boodle uh, have funny little nicknames for me from a talk that we gave. Um, I am generally a fan of, of technology, generally a fan of, of AI and exploring AI. I think it's helpful to a degree, but the things that keep me up at night are the fact that, um, like what we have seen in the last few weeks, images of Taylor Swift and, um, you know, a... Hong Kong charity that lost $25 million because someone spoofed an entire, like a conversation between a, a, a business leader and their, their employee. I force, I, I I'm really worried about whether people will trust what nonprofits are putting out there because they're worried that an organization or that some random person could create a website and a social media presence and even, you know, very realistic videos or, uh, or photos and, um, and they, they're all scams. So we're way far away from the, like, some Nigerian prince in your email that asks you for whatever, or some, like, I've actually heard of organizations that have gotten the email that says, like, our, my mom died and she's leaving you a planned gift and it's a scam. Now imagine that there's like a whole thing around that that's easily created by AI. That really worries me for particularly um, for uh, nonprofit organizations that don't have internal staff to sort of vet all of those components. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of want to take, you know, what we've talked about AI with AI and move into the compass and the beacon. So yeah. when you hear the idea of our first beacon, which is connecting the dots, um, which is kind of all about like enabling our systems and our strategies to be connected, how does AI play a role in that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the things that we're all pretty comfortable with is the fact that computers help us get our jobs done. We couldn't do most of our work without computers. They're faster at doing calculations. Their ability to help us do certain aspects of our work is, is really indisputable. And so AI has the ability to do that both with first drafts of generated text. I personally um, hate blank, blank screens. So generative AI truly helps me because I am better at editing than I am at creating something. That's just me. 
Uh, but then there are other folks who are really good at Excel, like, you know, Clay Buck is really good at Excel and, you know, doing all of those things that I couldn't ever do. So there are different aspects of that in terms of connecting the dots and being able to say internally with our staff, what are the roles and responsibilities? What are the things that we love to do that bring us joy? And what are the things that actually drag us down and burn us out and cause us to miss things? So when we're thinking about data in particular, AI is, is biased. AI has blind spots. But of course, humans do as well. So my hope is that with the combination of the technology and the human element, we create this Venn diagram where more of the dots are connected and there's a clearer picture than if humans alone were to try and do it just because of the limited processing power. And I think what I love about the compass analogy that you all are using is that the compass was created 2000 years ago and it was originally designed for like fortune telling. It was designed to create like, um, you know, a crystal ball to, to do whatever. And it took hundreds of years for people to use it for navigation. But the quick aside is that the geo when you're thinking about navigation, you're thinking about geography, right? Going north or going south and whatnot. But the magnetic north and the geographic north are not the same. So there's a variance and it requires humans to say, we have to sort of course correct. So when I'm thinking about connecting the dots, whether it's in you know data or in communications and content, I always want us to come back to that original concept of the, the compass to say, we're connecting the dots by taking the, the one element and then course correcting with our human lived and learned experience to get to the right place. That, that makes me think of the conversation we had with uh, Mina Das of Namaste Data, and she's really focused on uh, a limitation of AI and data sometimes can be that it it always will pick the majority, yeah. that, you know, the largest group, the largest, you know, put those together. And that can overlook certain minorities in a, in a whole variety of ways and lead to this kind of this homogenous group. Um, is that is that something that you think we need to focus on? And is that the, the human versus the AI and combining them that you're, yeah, you're and talking I think about? That requires the level of data literacy and ethical literacy that Mina is so good at. I love Mina. And I think the the point that I would amplify that she's making is that the the data can and this is the other risk of uh, that I see when it comes to AI is philanthropic exclusion. Mm -hmm. Because our data set says this, it is looking at that majority or those that most common or that most expected behavior, and we lose that outlier. We don't look at the outlier, and I think the outlier is where opportunity almost always exists almost exclusively exists in the outlier. So um, I was before AI and machine learning and all of that baby fundraiser 25 years ago, I was always a little bit concerned about RFM analysis because it it's based upon a very small set of potentially of what your donors have done before. And I think now that we're leveraging AI and algorithms to do more of that, we can lose track of exactly what Mina said. Awesome. Well, Cherian, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.